Okay, with that, we're live. Give me just a second to finish changing the settings. All right, yes. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, the third talk of the third day here in the conference. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to, uh, uh, to uh, introduce to you today a uh, group from Arizona State University, so uh, Ankushtale and Beckett Sterner, uh, who will be talking to us about explaining ambiguity in scientific language towards a computational approach. And I, I've, I've seen a little preview of this project before. This is a really, this is a really cool project. So I'm really excited to see, uh, to see what you guys have been up to on it lately. So please take it away. All right. Thank you, Charles. And, and thank you so much for putting this workshop together. It's been there's all these little gems that are scattered all over and it's really wonderful to find them and, and to connect with them as people give their talks. Uh, so for today, um, I wanna pick up uh, what's been a, a lightning rod for debate uh, among philosophers and historians and, and social scientists, um, and also in English and rhetoric uh, about the, the place of ambiguity in science. Um, is it something persistent that uh, we just have to accept? Is it something we can eliminate? Is it actually something we want to have around? Um, does it have a stable continuing role in scientific practice? And, uh, you know, many have argued that it leads to confusion um, and, uh, you know, incorrect errors uh, and so should be eliminated. Others have pushed for the value of metaphor and ambiguity, uh, or sorry, an analogy, for example, in opening up new ways of thinking and even um, enabling our senses to connect with the world in, in novel ways and, and ground um, new theories and, and sort of provide a foundation for literal language. Um, others have argued that we actually can do things together because uh, ambiguity lets us avoid having to agree on everything. Um, and so we know just enough about what we're supposed to do uh, to get it done, but not have to really understand all of the ways in which we differ from each other. And so it can be crucial to social action as well. Um, I think what everyone can agree is that it's still here and it seems to be sticking around for a while. Uh, but uh, the context in which scientific language is operating is changing in, in really um, sweeping ways. And so I think data science, data centric science here provides um, a new set of forces that are channeling the debate around the, the place and, and persistence of ambiguity, its value um, towards a focus on, on what machines can do, what are computers good at handling um, versus not. Um, and so, you know, in everyday language, um, we can rely on contextual information that's just really hard to communicate to computers. Uh, a lot of natural language processing is stuck on, on that background knowledge there. Um, and we can also build shared understandings uh, through having conferences over, you know, many years um, or being part experts in, in a particular field um, that as access to knowledge and the sort of networks that we're building grow larger, um, more people can enter a conversation and, and lack that background. They, they can't even see the context that others are picking up on. Um, and so one strategy as uh, scientific knowledge gets opened up and, and globalized uh, is to respond by trying to standardize uh, key technical terms to have a single fixed meaning, right? And so a lot of computer ontologies have this focus of, uh, I wanna know exactly what symbiosis means everywhere that it's used so that the computer can understand exactly what this data point uh, you know, is, is uh, signaling uh, in, in order for it to reason about it and, and, and find it in a database. But is this strategy of pushing for single uh, fixed and universal meanings always the best strategy for advancing science? Um, and part of what we're gonna argue today is that this new context for thinking about ambiguity highlights important and, and novel gaps in our understanding. Um, so how is ambiguity related to productive dissent and competition? Um, if we're building the basic uh, definitions of scientific terms into our data infrastructure, what happens when people disagree with those, how, do, how those concepts are defined? What happens when they wanna propose uh, a competing way of classifying and framing data, for example? Um, do we have to converge on a single standardized definition to avoid confusion? Um, maybe there are actually alternatives here where we can figure out on how to agree to disagree in a way that still allows us to communicate, um, but doesn't force us uh, to arrive at, a, at a, a sort of false consensus. And um, 
I think there are lots of new opportunities here to understand how social factors like changes in, in who's in a community, who's in a conversation, how different fields are connected, uh, how novel words um, you know, percolate across uh, corpora, um, influence the behaviors of uh, amb uh, ambiguous language use, like uh, is, is ambiguity preferred or not preferred in different contexts, depending how the social background is changing. And I also want to uh, highlight how uh, from starting from a sort of philosophical point of view about the questions of the, the role of ambiguity in science, um, there are a lot of really amazing things that have been happening in linguistics and computer science um, that, uh, at least to my experience, are not part of the philosophical conversation yet and really should be. Um, and I'm going to touch on a, a couple of those today, um, but just to, to um, uh, foreshadow there. Um, one of the novel insights out of cognitive linguistics that, that I've been really taken with is that ambiguity can actually improve efficiency of communication um, when con adequate contextual information is available. And the second one is um, there have been amazing advances in the last couple of years in terms of our um, ability to detect and quantify uh, the extent of ambiguity and its presence using natural language processing. And so there's a whole new subfield that's kind of uh, popped up called lexical uh, semantic change uh, that's been making um, pretty big strides. Okay, and so for today, um, what we're gonna do is start general um, and kind of set the scene with some big philosophical principles um, and then try and move, move down to the specific and say, well, how would you operationalize these principles? How would you determine if, if they seem to be in action in a particular context? Um, and that's the novel computational approaches sec uh, section. And then, um, we're going to, uh, if, if you make it through with us, there's going to be pretty pictures at the end, and we're going to start to explore how um, you could uh, uh, apply this, these new approaches using a corpus from JSTOR uh, around the study of the word subspecies as one of these uh, classically ambiguous and, and hated but also persistent uh, terms in evolutionary biology. All right, so that's where we're headed. And what I want to do is, is set up some competing ideals to start with um, to kind of frame the, the or connect with the prior literature on ambiguity um, and frame a, a questions going forward uh, that can inform uh, how we think about ambiguity in the context of data centric science. So, you know, crudely speaking, right, we know semantic ambiguity. So in particular, where words have multiple meanings. Um, it's sometimes productive, sometimes harmful, right? If you were gonna sum up the prior literature in a nutshell, uh, that's the short version, um, but we don't uh, really have a systematic understanding of where, when, how, and why. And so a lot of the studies that philosophers and historians and, and social sci uh, scientists have engaged in have been deep qualitative case studies. Um, and so we get some inklings there about uh, the conditions of productive ambiguity or harmful ambiguity uh, but not yet the, the position to really explore those more systematically. And so setting the ground for that is, is what I'm aiming to do in this section. And as background, um, a group uh, with uh, Ted Piantadosi uh, et al. Um, from 2012 uh, had a really lovely paper on uh, ambiguity in cognitive linguistics. And so they, they proposed two criteria for a communication system, which I think I'm going to sort of uh, take for granted as uh, things that we hope for our language to do and that the principles we're gonna describe should somehow be serving, right? Or somehow um, uh, helping us with. So the first one is that we're looking for a clear communication system in which the intended meaning can be recovered from the signal with high probability. Um, so if the speaker wanted to say X, right? Uh, a clear communication system is one where the listener can get X um, with high probability. An easy communication system is one in which signals are efficiently produced, communicated and processed. So if you wanna say X, how much effort do you have to put into say, saying X, right? Do you have to write a whole philosophy paper or can you just use a single word? Um, the, the, the spectrum of, of ease there depends on how much effort both the speaker and the listener have to put, into, uh, put in in order to get the, the intended meaning out. And um, I also wanna pull in a, a third uh, desideratum here around innovation, right? So an innovative communication system is one in which novel meanings can be rapidly generated and adopted. So not just a static kind of equilibrium system where all the meanings and all the terms are fixed, 
um, but where we're doing new things and want to say new things um, in, in response. And um, we want our language system and science to be flexible that way. OK, so the first principle um, sort of captures the, the response that I was describing earlier, where um, in the context of, of having clear uh, and easy communication, um, maybe the, the right strategy is um, to make sure that every term you use has exactly one shared meaning across all contexts, right? Uh, subspecies always means uh, geographically isolated things with, with morphological differences. No, no, no changes, no disagreement. That's just what it's always going to mean. And so uh, this certainly maximizes clarity um, because if you see that term, you know what the meaning is. Um, but if you need a lot of terms to describe each of your meanings uniquely in context and sensitive ways, um, that could actually lead to a very large vocabulary. Um, and that, that's not, that can get quite complicated for both the speaker and the listener to keep track of. Um, and it doesn't really have much to say about uh, how to make something innovative. Basically, you have to figure out what you're, supposed, what you're trying to mean um, before you introduce the term as far as this principle goes. And so one of the, the striking points that I, I haven't really seen highlighted in the philosophical literature, but that comes out of cognitive linguistics is that ambiguity can actually increase efficiency um, in a very uh, precise mathematical information theoretic sense. Um, when, if a term has multiple meanings, the context of the term's use provides you information about which of the meaning is intended um, in that token instance. Um, and the reason is that um, that enables you to reuse short, easy words, right? So words like bank um, uh, can have multiple meanings, but as long as I'm talking about going for a picnic versus um, you know, depositing a check, you're gonna be quite sure which meaning I, I intend for this short, easy word bank. Um, and so you can imagine if we, there's a lot of things that we wanna say very precisely in science, uh, overloading meanings into short terms like function or species uh, might actually be quite helpful for people as they're trying to communicate. So the second principle picks up on this and it um, proposes that terms should have multiple shared meanings that apply in distinct contexts. So uh, the virtue of ambiguity here is that you can reuse your term terms, but you have to make sure that they in fact do have a correct meaning um, and that those meanings are clearly signaled by the context of use. And so you preserve clarity, right? Ambiguity does not mean automatically mean confusion here, as long as you're careful about uh, matching contextual information to intended meaning. Um, I'm gonna keep moving. The third one uh, picks up on uh, something that doesn't really come into the cognitive linguistics context, uh, but does you know, has been a primary focus of the historical and, and philosophical literature, which is the importance of metaphor. Um, and so one thing that you, might, you uh, might advocate here is that terms should have multiple meanings that are locally determined in context. Um, so the, the highlight here is innovation rather than clarity. Um, if you want to say new things, you want to be able to use your language in surprising unexpected ways in a particular context and kind of see what happens. Right, um, And so the extent to which you can communicate uh, effectively with each other is going to depend locally on uh, how much background you have in common and the sort of shared history of how the, the use of that term is developed in that context. So what I've uh, given you is three different principles. Um, one which you know, um, treats ambiguity as, as harmful and wants to eliminate um, multiple meanings or the, the um, uh, availability or the possibility of having new meanings emerge in local context sort of interactionally. And then the other two recognize ambiguity as, as something productive, um, but, but they clearly depend on uh, assumptions of shared context and background know-how in order to realize that value in communication. And so uh, Piantadosi et al. Uh, do some interesting studies about uh, patterns of how many meanings are there for short words versus long words, simple words, you know, surprise, are, are easy to say words versus hard to say words, et cetera, um, in several different languages. But they don't really unpack uh, this background assumption about whether the speaker and listener can even share the same contextual information, know how to 
uh, see the cues and read them properly. And so um, I think this opens up an interesting opportunity to study how changing social historical conditions can impact um, the ways that scientists use ambiguous language. And so in this next section, uh, what I wanna do is um, start to unpack how we can take these ideals and then use them uh, you know, along with their, their conditions of applicability to make predictions um, that, that can then be tested using corpora. So um, I, looks like a fancy equation. It's actually quite simple. Um, when you get down to it, it's just saying, you know, the predictability of a term's intended meaning, um, it's, it's entropy or uncertainty, um, is just what you learn about the, the intended meaning for a particular context. Um, you know, given that context, uh, time, or, or yeah, um, yeah, times the probability of that context itself. So in a context, if I know that it's gonna be this meaning and not that meaning, I'm actually have great predictability. And as long as each context gives me certainty about the correct meaning in that context, then I really know what the term's gonna mean overall. But if I go to all the contexts and I'm just uncertain about each of the meanings, um, then we're gonna have maximal uncertainty, right? And I'm not gonna be able to predict what the intended meaning is with great accuracy. What's nice about this is that um, now we're, we're sort of working in a context of precise um, distinct meanings and, and uh, the context in which they occur. And these sorts of uh, features are detectable um, by uh, new natural language processing methods. And before I get there, I wanna just draw a couple uh, novel predictions out of this setup. Um, so does the availability of contextual information affect the use of ambiguous terms? Uh, just thinking in terms of the role of context in helping determine or you know, providing information about the correct meaning um, can, can get us to intuitive uh, thoughts here. So when we don't learn about context, right, the probability of a meaning uh, uh, is sort of uh, equally likely um, even given everything about uh, the, the usage uh, in, in which it occurs, um, then a term with fewer meanings is gonna be preferable over one with more meanings, right? So if I have a, a term here that has five possible meanings, one of which I want, and another term that has two possible meanings or only one possible meaning, and, and one of those is the one I want, um, then if context isn't doing much for here, uh, all else being equal, I'm gonna prefer the term with fewer meanings. But when context is informative, a term with fewer meanings um, is uh, all, you know, all else being equal, uh, interchangeable with one that has more meanings. Um, in terms of knowing enough to understand the intended meaning in a particular sentence, for example, um, if the context is doing all the work I need, uh, then it doesn't matter whether there's a, a term with five meanings or a term with one meaning, I'm gonna get the right meaning as I read it. And so what this is meant to, to do is to set up some expectations about the usage patterns of terms depending on the availability of context. And so um, what we've uh, proposed to do and, and started to explore is uh, investigating these predictions using a text corpus um, from JSTOR. And so the setup here is uh, to look at a set of synonyms um, that share at least one meaning in common. And so they're intersubstitutable inter in a sentence or in a particular linguistic context in a way that preserves the semantic meaning of that sentence. And we're calling that a sin set. And so then within a sin set, right, some words uh, that share a meaning might be short, uh, might be easy to say, might be longer. Um, some of those words might have other possible meanings, might have three other meanings, others might only have one. And so within the sin set, the, the properties of the synonymous terms can vary, um, but in a, in a way that's fairly fixed, uh, you know, across a corpus over time or that we can track in terms of their changes. And so uh, given, given the same recurring context in, in many different instances, we can look at how often each of the different synonyms occurs in that context and um, see whether some synonyms are becoming more common relative to the others and whether or not that's related and then explore whether that's related to external trends, right? So if you have more people publishing in a particular field, um, do you see a preference uh, for words with fewer possible meanings, right? 
if you're if you've got a large group that doesn't share the same background cues and knowledge, um, do you see language shifting uh, to prefer words that uh, re rely less on context to get the intended meaning? And so I just want to flag here that this this is a, a problem called synset induction in natural language processing, um, where basically you're looking to find uh, context in which a set of words is intersubstitutable while preserving the meaning, the intended meaning in that context. A lot of that work uh, is focused on studying everyday words out of uh, WordNet or Wikipedia, um, and it's kind of that big data computer science feel. Um, and our interest is sort of distinct in that we're, we're interested in, in digging deep into uh, relationships among a smaller handful of technical, technical terms within one field. Uh, like subspecies and some of its related terms. And uh, looking to combine an expert analysis of uh, the ways that those terms are used and their, their possible meanings um, it, with scalable methods that can handle a larger corpus. And so if we can find the contexts that occur in the equation that I showed earlier, and we know the meanings that are possible for each term in those contexts, um, we can start to get at trends in ambiguity over time, um, especially when we compare uh, alternative terms that share some of the same meanings. Okay, and so now the pretty pictures, if you've stuck around. Um, the focus of the case study is uh, subspecies as a kind of uh, overlooked, um, but still really rich and interesting aspect of this bigger debate uh, that philosophers of, of science are, are all uh, well um, aware of and, and um, probably is infamous much, much more widely, um, which is, you know, what is the species anyway? Um, how should we classify living things into these uh, meaningful biological units? And so um, we need to classify and we need to name these units in order to communicate facts about living things. Um, when you download biological data on the internet, all of that comes with names as identifiers. Um, but how we should carve those uh, groups out is hotly disputed um, and has been for, for, for many uh, uh, decades at this point. Within this bigger debate about species, the concept of subspecies is, is really important. And sometimes species and subspecies are, are uh, overlapping depending on who you're talking to. One person's species is another person's subspecies and so forth. And um, uh, it's been much maligned and attacked as a way, as a, as a category within the species unit, um, but it's also been in use uh, in, in even quite formal and precise ways since the 1870s. And so somehow it's managed to stick around, right? And that says that there's something here that we need to understand. Um, but it, it hasn't stuck around because everyone figured out what it's supposed to mean. It's been doing some other kind of work uh, in, in um, the scientific practice. And so there's not a lot of historical or philosophical work digging into uh, the debates over subspecies, how they've been used in different places, um, when um, people have been able to agree on a meaning versus not, and so forth. The corpus that we're gonna explore this with um, is from JSTOR and consists of uh, over a hundred journals uh, pulled out of the sort of ecology and evolutionary biology subject group that they've defined. And so this includes like things like systematic zoology, uh, renamed systematic biology, oikos, paleobiology, and mycologia, um, which is for fungi. And uh, so it, it's a targeted subset of uh, papers that were published in a select group of journals. And we're really honing in on uh, discourse from ecology and evolution uh, in, in the, the corpus that we're working with. And so there's a whole bunch of articles in there. Um, out of all of that, you can see here, um, this is just the absolute magnitude of the number of uh, token instances of the word subspecies over time. And of course, the corpus is also growing. Um, but this just kind of gives you a good sense of how many instances we have out of um, that many articles. Um, so it's a good number, um, uh, but uh, just still a, a small subset of the overall uh, set of papers. And um, we're gonna focus on a set of six words here, subspecies, variety, 
race, lineage, form, and ecotype. Um, and uh, primarily our results are gonna focus on subspecies, but I wanted to just sort of um, highlight how these are uh, related. We're trying to sort of explore uh, what we can learn about the, the, uh, these synonyms using natural language uh, processing methods. So the first thing that we were, were looking at is to try and understand um, how our sentences in which these different words occur in our corpus uh, related, are they all clustering together or are we seeing clear separations um, based on the, the keyword that's showing up in the sentence? And so each colored group here is, uh, a, or each dot here is a sentence and the color of the dot reflects the word that occurred in that sentence. So variety is orange, form is blue, subspecies is green, race is purple, et cetera. And so there's a thousand dots uh, for each color. And what you can see is that there are clearly separated clusters here, um, but also some that are overlapping. And I'm just gonna pop out for a second because um, the, the visualization tool, um, you know, what we're working with here is a very high dimensional representation of the sentences. And uh, it's the more dimensions you can actually have to play with the better. So this is the same set of clusters we were just looking at. Um, here is ecotype, there is subspecies and lineage. Um, so you can see here that actually subspecies is a fairly distinct group compared to race, variety, and form, um, and then lineage and, and ecotype really stand out. So we do, it does look like we have um, some overlap originally or, or initially in terms of the, the way that this uh, method, uh, BERT, is um, representing the, the context of these words and, and their semantic content, which is promising. Um, but then we wanna be able to dig deeper and start to tease apart here um, the lexical context in which the word has occurred uh, versus the meanings that are possible for that word um, in that context. And so um, the preliminary work that we've been doing here is to start defining lexical categories um, just focused on the term subspecies for now, um, where we're trying, uh, looking to unpack uh, distinct grammatical ways in which the term subspecies can be used in, in different sentences. And then um, eventually pair that with an analysis of the uh, available definitions of the term over time. So different published definitions of subspecies um, in order to look at the interplay between context and possible meanings. Uh, as, uh, and so just conscious of time here, um, the categories uh, that we're looking at are, are fairly coarse grain. So, you know, distinguishing between singular nouns and plural nouns, and then different sort of uh, grammatical categories that get paired with them. Uh, so do you have a the in front and a name at the end, uh, or just a the, um, or an indefinite article here, uh, a, uh, or a plural term. Uh, side note, you might think that um, uh, parts of speech tagging would get you this, um, but uh, apparently it always tags subspecies as plural or verb for whatever reason when we use the NLTK uh, toolkit. And so um, just focusing in on the subspecies terms, what we found is that these categories do indeed seem to um, form distinct clusters uh, within the embedding space that we were showing earlier. And so here's the five categories again with, with examples um, and then the highlighted uh, dots show uh, instances of those sentences that we've labeled by hand uh, in the corpus. And uh, in trying to see whether or not we can scale up the, the manual labeling work um, to apply to the whole corpus, um, we applied a K-nearest neighbors approach um, based on 150 uh, sentences as, as training data. And it, it did reasonably well out the gate in terms of getting an accuracy of 80%. And I think um, you know, as we grow the data set, um, there's, there's reason to hope that that's going to continue to improve. Okay, so that was a quick tour of how we were um, starting to define the lexical context in which we could then track the use of alternative terms over time as a way of getting at uh, preferences for terms with more meanings or fewer meanings um, 
in response to changing social uh, context. And uh, each of the different uh, steps along the way, I think, has, has lots of opportunity for, for novel work and, and uh, investigations. Um, formulating the theoretical principles um, based on the, on the background literature, I think, could really help connect the philosophical questions uh, to, to what's happening in linguistics and computer science. Um, I think there's a lot more that could be done in terms of drawing out predictions from the information theoretic framing that, that Piantadosi et al. introduced. Um, and then um, continuing to develop the uh, approach to synset induction that pairs uh, sort of the expert lexical categories uh, that we've labeled with a machine learning approach that can then scale up to a whole corpus um, is, is one of our key uh, next steps. And so I think I'm gonna stop there to make sure we have enough time. Fantastic! Thanks so much. This is this is really neat. I'm, I I I I hadn't I hadn't seen this data yet. This this is really pretty. I'm I'm, I'm impressed at how how well this is working. This is really cool. Um, already a couple of questions uh, uh, coming in. Uh, two, two from Susan Hudson actually. This is this is excellent. So, uh, our first question: in in ordinary language use. Uh, polysemia is common, but ambiguity is very rare, right? The bank example is is, is a good is a good instance of this. Uh, but so, so, do you think scientific language is following different principles? Um, so, I, I think that's actually an interesting question. I'm not sure that I uh, agree that ambiguity is rare. Um, I've seen that argued uh, in, by by um, Piantadosi, for example. Um, uh, sees ambiguity in within a context is rare. Uh, convinced, given the exchanges that I see between interdisciplinary scientists that are trying to talk to each other, um, and and in the the basic ways that uh, my colleagues try to communicate, seems like there's a lot of ambiguity there. So I think that's an interesting question to to push on that that um, you know might need a synthesis of of data to to support. Um, in the case of subspecies, you know, what you can see historically in the literature is that people are redefining it on the go as they're applying it. And so um, they themselves are not always clear about what a person uh, in a given paper uh, actually wants to mean by it unless they've defined it um, right up front in the paper explicitly. And that, that's often not the case. And then they fight about whether they're using it properly. Um, and so uh, they often say that, you know, people are, are applying the term incorrectly, uh, but it or uh, in a way that signals that they're not really understanding what the definition is supposed to be. Um, so in terms of available definitions and the sort of fluctuating community, I do think there's substantial ambiguity there, but I, that's also part of what we're hoping to get at as, as a quantitative measure. Um, how well can uh, an inexpert reader actually disambiguate the intended meaning uh, in reading a paper um, is, uh, I think, a good proxy for uh, what it would mean for the language use of a field to change as the community changes. So you've got a whole bunch of new people publishing um, or, or using the term subspecies. Uh, are they really understanding what the experts mean by it? Or are they um, using it in uh, uh, ways that aren't careful and that that leave the ambiguity actually quite substantial. That's really interesting. Thanks. Um, a, a second question. So uh, also from also from from uh, Susan Hunston. So when you were looking at the grammatical context of subspecies, did you uh, did you look at post modification with an of subspecies of of something? Yeah, and. Um, it's been interesting. I've started to dig into the variety, uh, the thousand uh, cases of the variety sentences. And uh, there, there's a distinct pattern where you might have uh, the great variety of uh, rock formations in a place. And, and um, the lexical structure there of, of having that, that intensifier or modifier in front uh, is signaling a different meaning for the word variety as a kind of range or extent of something rather than uh, the northern subspecies of goose, uh, for example. And so uh, I'm, I'm anticipating that these categories are going to have to get um, more sophisticated and fine-grained as we bring in the other synonyms. Um, 
And some of those patterns will include uh, or pick up on something like subspecies of a species name as uh, part of a, a larger group. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm not sure I'm, I'm entirely getting to the question there, but I'm definitely seeing that. And, and I think it's gonna be important in terms of defining the lexical context. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, good, good. That 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 gets it. Uh, I think. Um, so a question from um, Stefan Hesburgen, who asks uh, just a question for clarification. So, uh, what what is the what what outcome are you hoping from the corpus analysis, and how are you how are you trying to tie that back to these more general questions about ambiguity? That's just a, he just says that's a that's a thread that I a, a thought that I didn't follow. My my bad. But could you say a little bit more about that? No, and I, I mean I. I... Uh, I did it fast, and um, this is also something where it's been uh, an ongoing struggle to line up all of the ducks in a row uh, in terms of how the pieces fit together. So uh, the big picture is um, you've got words that are potentially more or less ambiguous, right? Um, and in, in, let's say, sorry, you have words that have few, more or fewer meanings. And so in a particular context, um, they may be more or less uncertain as which of those meanings is, is correct, and depending on the contextual information. Um, and so subspecies is, has relatively fewer, fewer meanings relative uh, compared to variety, for example. Um, what we're interested in ultimately is how preference for subspecies versus variety or form or lineage or other terms uh, is influenced by changes in the community of people using it. So if you have new people or other fields um, coming in, uh, we're hypothesizing that you're going to be able to count on relatively less contextual information across the set of speakers and, and listeners um, because there's less shared background knowledge and context or, and sort of history in the field. Versus if you have a relatively small and stable subfield, um, you can use uh, terms with many meanings um, because you can presume that the person you're talking to will know how to use the context to disambiguate it in a particular uh, uh, instance. And so the goal is to first figure out how do you get the context defined, and then you can track how the terms are used in the same context uh, at rates, you know, at, at different levels or frequencies across the corpus. Um, and connecting that back to the information theoretic framework, you can actually justify how you're tracking uh, predictability of meaning um, by looking at how uh, the substitu substitutability of those terms are informing your, your ability to, to know the, the um, frequencies of the senses. Great, thanks, thanks. Um, actually, that, that, that's a nice segue into another question here uh, from, from, from Cody O'Toole, who says, hey, Beckett. Uh, so this initial analysis was done uh, synchronically. Uh, uh, for the, they're at the same institutions. Uh, this initial analysis was done synchronically. I'm curious how this method could be adapted to apply it diachronically, uh, since meaning and therefore context often varies over time, especially over such a large time period in this subspecies corpus. So yeah, you were just you were just mentioning that near the end that that's a that's a that's a target for future work. How are you thinking about about adapting the adapting this kind of methodology for that? Yeah. So um, and there's I've seen different approaches in the in the literature right now. Um, this uh, cluster diagram is drawn from the whole corpus. So 18, um, probably in, in reality, 1870 in terms of the actual usage of subspecies up to the present. And so what we're seeing is, you know, a statistical random sample of sentences using these words from that whole corpus. So in that sense, it's giving us a, a diachronic kind of uh, picture of the, the full variation over time. Um, Part of what I'm doing uh, that I haven't shown today is going through uh, some of the key uh, sort of theory papers in the field and actually pulling out the definitions that they're proposing for these terms uh, and, and making a giant spreadsheet where you've got the, the definitions of subspecies that are being discussed uh, over time as rows and then uh, coding the criteria that they're mentioning in the columns. And so uh, you can see, you know, at some point genetic differences uh, enters into the picture, whereas in the 1880s, it's all phenotypic differences and focus on integrating a sort of continuity across geography 
um, versus some notion of, of being a distinct lineage in a genetic sense. Um, so uh, what's surprising for, from what I've seen there so far is that actually not that much has changed at root. Um, the, the idea that you've got some amount of difference in some kind of trait uh, and that it's geographically distinct where you know the, the populations that are geographically distinct, that's pretty much been there since 1870. And so you can uh, add twiddles around that, uh, but in that sense, um, the semantic space for subspecies, I, I would argue, um, has been fairly constant. Um, I've seen other approaches that, you know, if there's uh, really novel changes, you start from an early period of time, you do your analysis for a 10 year period, and then you move forward to the next 10 year period and so forth. And so you'll see things added to your picture that you'll have to code and categorize um, step by step as you go. Um, and our hope is that we can try and do get the big picture uh, up front if the, we can take for granted certain um, stability in the, the mean differences in meaning over time. Great. That's actually, and that's actually a nice segue into, uh, into the next question from, uh, from Stefan Linquist, who says, it's a great talk. Um, I might have missed this, but could, could you explain whether there's a, a quantitative signal that you think will distinguish the sort of good ambiguity from the, the bad ambiguity? And actually, this is the part that I think connects right to your last answer. So maybe you want to answer the reverse. Uh, what are your thoughts on what good ambiguity means in the context of discussion of, of, of subspecies in this, in this corpus? Yeah, so um, the setup that I have in mind there is uh, the, the principles that I, I gave earlier um, help us interpret what it means to see certain patterns in usage. Um, so if you see a community that uh, is making use of words with, with many meanings, um, and that uh, you know those those words are also tend to be the shorter, easier to use ones. Um, then that's consistent with the principle, with the second principle that says um, ambiguity, so long as meanings are used in distinct contexts, is beneficial. Um, by contrast, if you see a community that is using terms with very few meanings, and in you know in a way that's consistent across uh, all of the different uh, discourses. Then that would be consistent with the first principle, uh, which says that you want your, your terms to have one single meaning in, in all contexts. Um, what I'm what I'm really hoping to get um, down the road is to actually see those patterns change, and to try and tie those changes to things going on um, outside the the corpus. Um, so if you see a community that was using uh, lots of terms with single meanings, and now um, you know, it gets smaller and it's sort of now a very stable set of people talking to each other for 20 years and you see them drift towards using terms with more shorter, easier to use terms with more meanings. Um, I think that signals that uh, there's also been a shift in how they're applying ideals or norms to the language that they're using. Um, and so that's the way that, that ultimately I'm looking to uh, connect patterns in the corpus to the, the applicability or adoption of these ideals um, as, as, uh, norms for, for how scientific language should be designed. Excellent. Okay. So that's the last question in the, in the Q and a box. So I get to, I get to, I get to ask one of my own. Um, so one thing that, one thing that I was wondering, and this is, this is, uh, a bit more technical, but how, how, uh, how to put this how clean did you find your data had to be to be fed into the uh, into the BERT system? So how how uh, how how precisely manually clean? How much how much did you go back through your corpus? Um, yeah, so the JSTOR corpus is um, a kind of grab bag because my understanding is that they've been running OCR year by year as they're uh, adding new articles and journals. And so the OCR that they system that they would have used in 2010 is not the same OCR system that they're using in 2020. Um, but that's not uniformly distributed historically because they're adding new journals with archives 
And so it's not like just the old articles are cruddy and the new articles are great. It's more like the new journals might be better. Um, and the OCR is definitely uh, messy. And um, we've been uh, exploring the feasibility of not doing a lot of hand cleaning um, in part because we're looking to get at kind of aggregate trends um, and you know, changes in usage of terms on a fairly large scale over time, uh, rather than uh, trying to, to parse single sentences to, to a high degree of, of uh, like, uh, sorry, to, to interpret sentences to a high degree of precision. Um, and, uh, you know, BERT works with bad data. Um, what it's telling you with bad data is, is a little bit questionable. Um, and one of the things that we discovered is that uh, for our application, the existing training data set of BERT doesn't really have the best coverage. And so ecotype is just not even in there. Um, and what BERT does in those cases is pretend that ecotype is actually an average of the word eco and the word type, um, and then produces embeddings based on that, which is, uh, surprisingly not bad, I guess, all things considered, but not, not something that I would um, uh, see as ideal. And I hate, to, I hate to do it, but I have to cut you there for time. Oh, okay. 